was the summer of 2014, and for my son's bar mitzvah present, just like many Jewish parents, we wanted him to bond with the Holy Land. Oh, it worked perhaps too well. My husband had stayed back at the hotel, and our friends, my son and I, had just stopped in a pharmacy. Run! Run to the bomb shelter, sweetie! Please! Please hurry! I didn't hear the sirens at first, but the Israelis did. They're used to hearing these things. We ran to the back of the storeroom. It was a 12 foot by 24 foot windowless bomb shelter. My heart's pounding. Boom! Boom! I hear and feel the percussion of the exploding bombs. I'm trying not to get sick. I look at my 13 year old son and I think I'll never forgive myself if something happens to him. That's an excerpt from a speech I gave to the Orange County Jewish Bar Association. It was the first but not the last time we had to run to a bomb shelter. Our adventure and my transformation is also the subject of my book, Blasted from Complacency, A Journey from Terror to Transformation in Israel. There is no chapter in a parenting book on what to do when a war starts and you're on a family vacation. Think touring extraordinary and sacred sites mixed with cowering in bomb shelters. I'm still trying to get over the Jewish guilt of taking my son to war for his bar mitzvah present. The impact of being human targets helped me understand the plight of Israelis living like this, and it also made me want to work on peace. How Israel is often described on the news is not what I'd seen with my own eyes, and I felt Palestinian parents also preferred their children playing safely in their backyards. The missiles exploded just near enough to blow apart my world as I knew it, forever changing me, and you'd never recognize my life today with what it was like then. I believe I found my life's purpose. Hello, I'm Penny St, and I'm the host of Peace with Penny. Today we'll have a unique show. At Peace with Penny, we attended a special event called Friendship Across Difference with Imam Abdullah Antipli and Maytal Friedman of Shalom Harmit Institute of North America. And we were granted permission to share it with you. Special thanks to Temple Bethel of South Orange County, the Jewish Federation of Orange County, the Rose Project of Orange County, and the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America. It was an opportunity to hear how the Muslim Leadership Initiative tries to build relationships of understanding, respect, and trust between North American Muslim and Jewish communities. This is seeking peace by identifying similarities and diversity between our two communities. Where's the pathway cleared for understanding and where can some spring cleaning help? Through a rigorous academic curriculum and exposure to diverse narratives, MLI seeks to expand participants' critical understanding of the complex religious, political, and socioeconomic issues facing people in Israel and Palestine. The program invites North American Muslims to explore how Jews understand Judaism, Israel, and Jewish peoplehood. When someone says they are pro-Israel or pro-Palestinian, what do they mean? Assuming you know is the first mistake. What is a Jew? Religion, race, ethnicity, culture. What is a Palestinian? Within Israel, in the West Bank, in Gaza? It's complicated, and these definitions are always influenced by our own perceptions. All right, so let's get started. Peace with Penny presents Friendship Across Difference, a conversation with Imam Abdullah Antipli and Maytal Friedman of Shalom Hartman Institute of North America. And the discussion is led by Rabbi Kavod Weeder of Temple Bethel of South Orange County. It's really good to see everybody. Um, my name is Kavod Weeder. I'm the rabbi here at Temple Bethel of South Orange County and really want to give um, great thanks to not only the Shalom Hartman Institute for having this amazing program that we're going to hear about and explore around today, but also the Jewish Federation of Orange County. Um, Lisa Armoni has been instrumental in being able to um, not only help support 
a weekend for the Muslim Leadership Initiative that's happening here in Orange County, but also being able to make this evening possible and helping uh, make this shidduch or this match between um, with Temple Bethel. So I'm going to introduce our two our two guests here, and then this will be a, a bit of a dialogue and a panel as a way of learning. And I really appreciate everybody who is either. Um, online or here in person to uh, to come and be that's with us today. So Imam Abdullah Antepli is a fellow on Jewish Muslim relations at the Shalom Hartman Institute and co-director of the Muslim Leadership Initiative. He's on the faculty at both Duke University Sanford School of Public Policy and Duke Divinity School where from 2008 to 2014, he served as the university's first Muslim chaplain, one of only a handful of full-time Muslim chaplains at US colleges and universities. He's recently recognized as one of the most influential Muslims in US higher education by the nonprofit Times. In his multiple, yeah. <laughs> that deserved an applause. <laughs> In his multiple roles at Duke, Imam Abdullah engages students, faculty, and staff across and beyond campus through seminars, panels, and other avenues to provide a Muslim voice and perspective to the discussions of faith, spirituality, social justice, and more. Imam Abdullah also serves as a faculty member in the Duke Divinity School, teaching courses on Islam and Muslim cultures. From 1996 to 2003, Imam Abdullah worked on a variety of faith-based humanitarian and relief projects in Myanmar, in Burma, and in Malaysia with the Association of Social and Equ Economic Solidarity with Pacific countries. He then served as the first Muslim chaplain at Wesleyan University and subsequently as the Associate Director of the Islamic Chaplaincy Program and Interfaith Relations and an adjunct faculty member at Hartford Seminary in Connecticut. He's also the founder and executive board member of the Association of College Muslim Chaplains and a board member of the Association for College and University Religious Affairs. So quite a resume. <laughs> Maytal Friedman is the director of intergroup initiatives at Shalom Hartman Institute of North America, where she previously served as Muslim Leadership Initiative co-director along with Yossi Klein Halevi and Imam Abdullah. She has served as Senior Program Director at Repair the World, where she led the organization's signature multi-site volunteering initiative. Prior to joining Repair the World, Maytal was selected as a Dorot Fellow to volunteer and study in Israel, where she directed and produced a film on women's religious identity. Maytal also worked at Cases, an alternative to incarceration in New York City, and founded a community library with a local nonprofit in Mimbale, Uganda. As a Wexner Graduate Fellow, Davidson Scholar, Maytal earned a master in public administration and nonprofit ma management with a specialization in international development from New York University. She also holds a Bachelor of Arts from Princeton University in Religion and African Studies and lives in Westchester, New York with her family. Okay, so let's launch right in. So together you, you launched um, the Muslim Leadership Initiative, MLI. Can you tell us about the vision for the program and what you hope to accomplish? What brought you, brought you to this? Yeah, just you'll turn it on, sorry. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, everyone. Shalom. It is a distinct pleasure and honor. Thank you for that warm and gracious welcome. It's wonderful to be in Orange County. <clears throat> MLI Muslim Leadership Initiative, which is housed at Shalom Hartman Institute, <clears throat> initially uh, it went through my own partnership with Shalom Hartman Institute. It is a very genuine and sincere desire to see American Jews and American Muslims, how can we do better in America as two distinct minority faith communities which has remarkable similarities between Judaism and Islam and which has remarkable social, ethical, moral challenges, very similar and unique to us as well. I told a group of friends this morning uh, here in the uh, <clears throat> other part of the Orange County, as a college Muslim chaplain, every August I welcome a new freshman, Muslim freshman coming to my uh, university. 
it's one of the happiest time of my life. And these Muslim parents, they drop their daughters and sons to Duke University dorms. They turn the corner, cry about an hour and a half. <laughs> and with the swollen eyes, they come and find me. And they ask three things, all the time three things. Imam Saab, make sure my daughter and son shows up at Juma. Make sure you take attendance. At least once a week, they appear in your horizon, in your radar screen. <clears throat> okay, that's pretty much within my job description. Second, make sure before they graduate from Duke University, they will date, ideally engage with a fellow Muslim with the opposite gender. <clears throat> make sure. So my job, my expectation is make sure I will find another fellow Muslim boy and girl and they will be happily married after. The third one is the most profound and theologically grounded. And then the third thing they ask, Imam, make sure they go to medical school. <laughs> Make sure they, they got, is there anything more Jewish than this? <laughs> Typical Jewish stereotype. So this encounter every year is almost no exception. Is another indication uh, and somewhat painful reminder for Muslims and Muslim parents and Jewish parents, we have similar concerns. Will our children, grandchildren hold on to this tradition? Will they have loyalty to this tradition? Uh, is the cost of being an American and making in America means we have to lose everything. We have to lose everything that, that, uh, uh, that makes us who we are. Another example is uh, when the Pew result came in 2013 about Jewish Americans, when Pew had this decade long research about the Jewish American identities and the, the levels of integration into American society, the next day, I had like almost a dozen phone calls from all over the United States, Muslim communities calling my office, leaving a message and saying, you seem to know something about Jews and Muslims. We read the report, we are horrified. The levels of assimilation, the levels of interfaith marriage, the level of disconnection and checking out of the tradition. So look at these two communities, how similar they are in their deep core challenges and opportunities in American society. Despite similarities in our theological and religious and social concerns, American Jews and American Muslims, we are not doing well, mainly because of the way in which we experience and understand Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The way we observe and experience, the way we consume information about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, that toxicity of that political conflict in the Middle East, I'm not trivializing it, I am not trivializing or dismissing neither my own communities and myself, my loyalty and attachment to Palestinian suffering and Palestinian solidarity, and neither I'm trivializing the Jewish community's solidarity with the Zionism and Israel either. But the way in which that conflict, that division and polarization happening in the Middle East, it is spilling over to the United States and it's polarizing us. It is dividing us in increasing fashion. And <clears throat> in 2010, 10 years after 9-11, when uh, we were watching to see if America and fellow Americans are really uh, responding to post-9-11 crises, are we recovering from that insanity of constant repetition of Islam is evil, Muslims are terrorists after 9-11, over and over again, when we were looking how the American community is doing in terms of understanding Islam as a religion and American Muslims as fellow American citizens, it was very clear around 2010 over a Park 51 controversy. Do you remember? When a group of Muslims in New York City was trying to build a mosque. Every poll was showing that our interfaith efforts, our outreach, our engagement with the Jewish community and the Christian communities, it was making marginal impact at its best. And the larger number of American Muslim, American citizens, American, fellow Americans, they were somehow internalizing that Islam is evil and Muslims are terrorist stuff. And within the two community was the most vulnerable. It was very clear, the rising Islamophobia, rising Muslim hatred was the intentional deliberate campaign against scaring Americans with Islam and Muslims was coming from two distinct communities. One far right uh, evangelical Christian communities and the, another, uh, another sources of this misunderstanding and this bias against Islam and Muslims was coming from uh, a non-representative marginal quantitatively, but qualitatively very impactful far-right Jewish organizations and the Jewish communities. 
And when we find out who are these people who are behind Sharia ban, behind uh, 2012 um, uh, campaigns against Islam and Muslims, some, again, marginal, they don't represent the American Jewish community, but because of their qualitative impact, they were hold, holding large segments of the American Jewish communities hostage by tapping into their resources in promoting hate and bigotry against Islam and Muslims. So in reaction to this, a group of very close friends of mine who are in this business of fighting against Islamophobia, anti-Muslim hatred, we took this as a self-critical, uh, uh, if these American Jews are not able to understand us, if these uh, bad faith actors so easily manipulate us, scare them about Islam and Muslims, it's part of our fault that we weren't able to explain ourselves. We weren't able to engage with them. So if we find a credible, respected Jewish organization, and through our partnership with that organization, can we reach out to American Jewish communities by showing goodwill and understanding to them? And Shalom Hartman Institute, as you know, as you are affiliated with, is, is that organization came in response to my prayers, that we were able to <clears throat> not only take eight cohorts now of these group of American, North American Muslims, Canadian, we have several members of that group here with us today. We were able, this is not a dialogue, this is not an engagement. And after, after we hear from Metal, maybe I can say a little bit more of the program, uh, about the program, has been nothing but a profoundly successful in its impact in terms of understanding and making sense of American Jewish communities, connection, loyalty, affinity, love and appreciation to Judaism, Zionism, and Israel. We were able to make sense of their psychological makeup. We were able to make, see, make sense of the, uh, the world through their own eyes. We were able to see it, and we were able to meet the American Jewish communities where they are. Education, it's been a successful program, but in terms of communal politics, we are going to talk. It's a lot more complicated. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for welcoming us here uh, tonight. I'll start with a personal story. Um, from the year that I lived in Jerusalem uh, working on, on that film, um, I also studied Arabic. <clears throat> and every, every week I would walk from West Jerusalem, where I lived, through an ultra-Orthodox neighborhood, Masharim, across what uh, was the Green Line into East Jerusalem uh, to Arabic class. And inevitably, no matter what I was wearing, no matter how I was dressed, jeans, a t-shirt, a backpack, uh, somebody would say to me, the Kotel, the Western Wall, is that way. It was clear that I didn't belong, and it's, it was clear that people who looked like me, other Jews, other American Jews, and other Israeli Jews, did not go into those neighborhoods. And similarly, when I spoke to Jewish family and friends, and I said to them, every week I'm studying Arabic. Oh, where are you studying Arabic? At El Uds, El Quds University. They would say, well, isn't that in East Jerusalem? You can't go there, it's not safe. Because they didn't go there. And, uh, and, and it was very clear to me the way that that dividing line, that road between Masharim and East Jerusalem was not just a road, but a real barrier, a real barrier between, between people. And as you heard from Abdullah, that barrier that exists in Israel-Palestine, that barrier that exists three miles away was being translated um, back here in terms of relations between Muslim and Jewish communities. So I actually joined uh, MLI after Trump's election. Uh, Trump, the program was already in existence. Um, <laughs> and um, and right, shortly after he was elected, as you remember, he initiated the Muslim ban, and Jewish groups and other groups were pouring out at airports and into the street um, in sincere solidarity with Muslim friends and neighbors and fellow Americans uh, to oppose the kind of hateful rhetoric and hateful policy that Trump was putting into place. And yet despite that, there was clear division and clear suspicion uh, between our communities, and it became um, increasingly clear to me that that we were talking past each other, that the very divisions that, that we had spoken about were making it impossible for us to be in relationship with each other. Uh, the term Zionism is just one example. What, what I understand as Zionism, what I have grown up with and is close to my heart around um, what Israel 
can be, maybe it isn't yet, but what Israel could be for the Jewish people uh, is, is not what many of my Muslim friends and colleagues understand when they first hear the word Zionism, which for them is sometimes equated with racism or colonial settler policies. And so uh, the, the idea of this program where Muslim leaders were actually coming and trying to understand Jew Jews for who they are was incredibly intriguing to me. And, um, and the more that I got into the program, the more that I met the participants who were stepping into significant controversy, risking their own personal and professional reputations to build bridges and to understand um, who we are, was just such a profound um, experience. And watching over the last five years the ways in which that, um, that deep education uh, has allowed them to then go into Jewish communities very much like this one and speak about who they are uh, and, and the Jewish community's openness and willingness to hear that from people who uh, first listened uh, has been quite a, a profound experience. So give us a little example of what's some of the learning that takes place at MLI, at the, you know, how do, how do Muslims and Jews learn together? Uh, so the, the program um, is uh, an intensely academic one. Um, there is a lot of uh, study, and study in the traditional Jewish way of, of taking texts, grappling with them. And what the Hartman Institute does is bring out the themes and ideas um, and apply them to modern day uh, questions, modern day challenges that the Jewish community is facing. Uh, and one of the promises that we made when, when Imam Abdullah approached us about developing this program with him is that we're not creating a new curriculum. We are going to teach and invite Muslim leaders into the internal conversation that Jews have. We're not going to craft a narrative that they would like that, a, that, that presents a particular story about who we are, but we're actually going to share with them the good, bad, and the ugly, both about our tradition, our conflicts, our life in America, and about um, our relationship to and um, understanding of Israel and Zionism. And so I would say maybe even to the chagrin of the participants, um, there is never one narrative presented, but really they enter into the argumentation and the debate um, from our tradition. Going back to Talmudic sources, uh, and, um, and many of them joke that when they come back and they you know, say to their Jewish friends, oh, you know that Talmudic passage, Tanur Shel Achnai? And their Jewish friends are like, what? Where, how do you know so much Talmud? Um, Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, Hillel, Shammai. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's highly text-based, and it goes all the way from biblical texts and questions of God, uh, how do Jews... Uh, understand God, how do they understand God in the Bible, how do rabbis understand God, um, to questions of rabbinic authority, all the way through uh, questions uh, and of power and justice um, as they relate to Israel and uh, the Palestinian conflict. Um, and more and more, we've also been exploring American-Jewish relationship to America and questions of power and vulnerability, anti-Semitism, uh, and, uh, and Jewish responsibility here in North America. Beautiful. Maybe a few examples instead of going to detail, but it's incredibly important what Maital shared. The curriculum of MLI to these North American Muslim leaders is not Judaism, Zionism 101 to Muslims. Mm -hmm. It is not a dialogue or engagement program. It's the same exact curriculum that Hartman has been teaching for the last 50 years to thousands of rabbis, thousands of community leaders, the same exact the invitation is to be, <clears throat> again, witnessing the internal Jewish dilemma. And it's incredibly honest. The good, the bad, and ugly, no topic is off the table, which is incredibly profound. I will remember, I remember like one of those really home run moments of learning. One participant, <clears throat> six months into the program, she said, Abdullah, I hate you. I really hate you. I said, what happened? You know, after, before this program, I was telling to myself, I'm not an anti-Semite. I'm an anti-Zionist. I'm an anti-Israeli. I am, I am not an anti-Semite. But now that I see what Zionism is and isn't, and how differently understood and experienced by a broad spectrum of North American and Israeli Jews, they don't make that distinction. 
So now that comfortable space I was sitting for years, feeling good about myself, is not comfortable anymore. The, the similarly, as an American Muslim, when people tell me what Islam and Islam isn't, who Muslims are and who, what they are and what they are not about, I say, you can't do that. You cannot define who I am. You have to allow me to define and self-express myself. But I've been doing this to the Jewish community for years on my own. And it's not right. I don't have to agree any political implications of that form of nationalism or ideology. But I can't impose identities on people who themselves are not defining themselves in those terms. This is a dayinu moment, as we say in Islam. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an incredible dayinu moment because this could happen more. Another example on the Jewish side, even though we are students in that program, even uh, we are receiving this curriculum, educational curriculum, I think we made an incredible impact to Shalom Hartman faculty, staff, and people. I will never forget, after maybe a year into the program, some of the staff are Israelis. They grew up in Jerusalem. They can see Aqsa from their windows, from their home windows and from their office windows. They, uh, I remember like one of those moments, I, I've been living in this city for 45 years. I neither noticed Aqsa nor ever wondered why is this important to uh, the Muslim community. I had no idea why, why this was, there was such a big deal about this. She said, I, I now cannot unsee it. I cannot unsee it anymore. It's right there. Your presence, this relationship is impacting in such a way that there's an open space in my heart to your narrative, to your story, mm. to your understanding, which is <clears throat> impossible to unsee again, undo again. Beautiful. So just to, to, to move, go on with that a little bit more, <clears throat> one of the common critiques of the program is that it's, that it's one-sided, right? That you're, you're exposing Muslims to the Jewish narrative. Um, and yet what you were just saying right there was the sense of, well, now there's, as a result of the program, there are Jews that are now also um, open to what the reality might be for Muslims. But that's not the bulk of the program. That's not so. Um, how can you justify just bringing Muslim leaders to only understand Jewish narratives about Israel if this is a, a Muslim leadership initiative? This question is an accurate one, but it's a reflection of this deficit of trust between our communities. This uh, this deficit of. Uh, um, ill will or abundance of ill will. Like if there is a one-sided education, there must be something bad behind this. The program, but as definition, as we have been explaining, yes, it is one-sided. That is accurate. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. When thousands of Americans go to China, learn Chinese and Chinese culture, nobody asks them, oh, because I'm learning your, understanding your culture, you have to learn mine. Or while you're presenting Chinese, I don't understand the logic behind this. Every, most form of education is in this way. And if you ask these critiques, uh, critics of the program, oh, this is one-sided, you are neglecting the other side, or that should be a balanced representation, as if they are from those communities when there is a presentation of the Palestinian narrative, side by side, always the Israeli or the Zionist narrative has been presented. Like, when you are making a moral critique and attack, are you standing in any moral ground that you actually practice what you are preaching? That's absolutely not the case. And educationally, it is one-sided, and that's what, by design and by intention, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with it. The third thing, the problem, logical problem, again, um, people can't see how this is morally inconsistent. The third thing is, if I want to learn Palestinian narrative, why would I go to Israeli Zionist organization? That expectation is even uh, understandably so, and I will tell you, there's a component about the Palestinian narrative but it's independent from the Hartman. Hartman so admirably gives the participants a time and opportunity and even resources to supplementally learn more about the Palestinian narratives. And almost every single participant, at least uh, in sufficient levels, understand and has been exposed to Palestinian narratives. That's the whole idea, to learn the Jewish and Israeli narratives on this issue. But <clears throat> Hartman gives independence to me and the other Muslim faculty to develop that Palestinian component independently where we can go and understand and deepen 
our understanding of the Palestinian narratives from Palestinians through Palestinian organizations. Mm -hmm. So this is a logical fallacy. I'm trying to control my anger and frustration <laughs> so that I can say something reasonable. Because this is an easy mudslinging um, of a, of a <laughs> it is not coming from a good place. That's what I'm trying. If most rational people will understand, if you go and apply to a master's program, people deliver a set curriculum. And of course, that's the curriculum you are signing up to understand and make sense. You don't demand that, not that I'm learning your program, you have to do X, Y, and Z. That's not, there's, it doesn't work that way. I, I want to add uh, two, two pieces to this. Um, one is a little bit on the pedagogy, which is that um, oftentimes when we're in interfaith spaces, we feel the need to uh, give comparisons. Um, you do this, and, and you, know, you believe in God this way, so that we're, we're understanding each other's traditions actually through our own lenses. And one of the things that MLI aspires to do is to try to understand um, Jews and Judaism um, Israel and Zionism on its own terms. Uh, in one of the opening sessions, Danielle Hartman um, often often shares with the groups, like you're gonna at the beginning, you're gonna try to understand what we're teaching you within your own categories. But your own categories are categories from the Muslim tradition, and you can't understand Judaism through the categories of Islam. You actually need to understand Judaism as Judaism, and that's a really, really, really hard thing to do. And sometimes when we're so concerned about the back and forth, we miss out on the opportunity to understand something for what it is and not just within um, our, own, our own lenses. It's a very, it's a very difficult challenge. Um, and I would say that actually um, I had this experience um, on the flip side on a program called Encounter, on a program that brings Jewish leaders to hear Palestinian voices within the West Bank and East Jerusalem. And we spend five days, and the program spends five days, only listening to Palestinian voices. And you know what? They get the same critique. They get the same critique. Oh, you're there listening to Palestinian voices? Well, why aren't you telling the Jewish narrative? Why aren't you talking about Zionism from the Jewish perspective? And they have quite a similar response, which is Jews have all sorts of other places to learn about Israel and Zionism from the Jewish perspective. They have day schools, they have camps, they have supplementary schools. There are plenty of places for them to go. Where is the space where they get to hear Palestinian voices telling their stories? And that is um, the construct. And I also th I think in many ways, all of our work, all of our work operates within uh, an ecosystem. And each of our organizations needs to find the way in which we're contributing to building bridges. Um, and our organization, the Shalom Hartman Institute and the partnership with um, Imam Abdullah on MLI is really about education. And there are other organizations that do work in advocacy. And there are other organizations that do work in diplomacy and relationship building. Uh, and our particular focus is around the education. And the bad blood that we try to explain, it is not a Muslim paranoia. There are those Hasbara trips there are those propaganda uh, outreaches where people are taking trips and seeing on the one side and sugar-coated version. Uh, and I think that bad blood, that precedence for that kind of bad stuff is people assume this is one of them. This is another, another Hasbara trip. It's mm -hmm. absolutely not the case. But to supplement the education, because initial first couple of cohorts, people who went there were, they have decades of pro-Palestinian activism. They already know pro-Palestinian uh, Palestinian reality, the depth of Palestinian suffering. They all have decades of involvement and engagement. But as we recruited more people, most American Muslims are at least nominally would be pro-Palestinian, but we realized their knowledge base is not strong enough, so we increasingly added two additional days independently. Its curriculum, its education is independently uh, built by myself and Palestinian faculty that I have I have developed a relationship with where we spend one day in West Bank and another one full day within Israel in Arab cities. 20% of the Israeli society is Palestinian, Arab, majority Muslim. And that 20% of Palestinians, their voice even within the Palestinian communities are not heard of. When people think of Palestinian activism, they think Gaza, they think of uh, West Bank, they think of refugees all around the world. 
But those who are Israeli citizens, Palestinians, their voices, their, their dilemmas, their challenges and opportunities are often not even mentioned. So we spend one full day with that community as well. But again, this is not at the expense of our curriculum on, on the Jewish version or Jewish narratives. This is an additional supplement that we are providing. Beautiful. You know, you, you spoke about learning about each other, trying to step outside of your own lenses to, to learn about each other. And I'm wondering, um, either for you personally, Abdullah, or from participants that you see in MLI, what would you say is the most, either the most, unco most common kind of aha moment about the Jewish experience and the Israeli experience? Like, what was, you know, what do you see as being, wow, that's what it's about for them? I'm like, so I'd love to hear about that. And in your experience, Maytal, also just through the work that you do, what's been kind of the aha moment for you about the Muslim experience? Uh, two, two, I think, two very different things. One is um, the, the prayer experience. I, I have to start with the prayer experience um, from being able to participate um, and join in um, Muslim prayer. And it is really such a transformative uh, experience that is, feels quite different than uh, being in a Jewish prayer setting. Um, people get, first of all, if you haven't experienced it, I highly recommend you find um, a, a Muslim friend, a colleague, uh, a local mosque. Um, people get shoulder to shoulder, foot to foot, very close together. Um, there are no prayer books. It is being led uh, and, um, in, in the front, and, and people are going down to their knees, getting all the way down to the ground, and it is such a physical uh, experience of submission that really uh, that that is embodied in a way that um, sitting in in the pews with a prayer book uh, feels very very different um, and so it's, it's truly a gift to be able to um, experience and see how other people supplicate uh, and and offer prayer and um, that that one really always leaves me uh, leaves me inspired. Uh, and I think, I think what Abdullah said um, earlier about um, noticing Aqsa is a really significant one. And not just um, the physical space, but the deep and multifaceted connections that uh, the Muslim community has to Jerusalem and to the Palestinian people, I, um, I have heard uh, and experienced, you know, it's our holiest city, and we have only one. Um, and for Muslims, it's their third holiest city. And so, you know, why do they really care so much um, about it? And, and then to experience, to be in Jerusalem with people who are having um, intensely spiritual connections to, to Al-Aqsa, um, to this, this holy site and understanding the, the deep spiritual um, historic connection of, of the story of um, Muhammad uh, on that, that site. Um, and, then, and then also, you know, for us, um, the, the notion of peoplehood is really significant and standing by um, your people and, and, um, and seeing that reflected in another community that also cares deeply about uh, their their fellow believers uh, is, is quite powerful. Beautiful, thank you. I will mention two incredibly consistent and very common OHA moment. One very positive, one difficult one, and which explains the heart of the program as well. Like I have seen this over and over again. When Muslims and Jews in the same room spend enough time and there's a little bit of flourishing of trust where they can suspend those political uh, jargon and mistrust, once they connect to the Jewish community in their religiosity, in religion, when the Jewish religious language is spoken, <laughs> I remember one of the participants said, like, every once in a while, I have to pinch myself. I shouldn't like these people. Like, what's going on? Uh, it is so similar. The language is so similar. One participant, we went to the Western Wall, 
And she looked at the English translation of the prayers that these people are saying in the Western world, and she started crying. I used to see these people and hate them. Look at the language they are using, the way they pray to God. In the same way, uh, in such a beautiful way, they are glorifying God's names. This is over and over again, understanding the Jewish legal, normative, but also deeply devotional, spiritual language is so similar to Muslim experience. That similarity always mesmerizes and enthralls the Muslim uh, in every level. Like It's almost inevitable. They have to sort of come back to their senses. Like, what's going on here? Am I in a mosque or a synagogue? Am I in a madrasa or a yeshiva? Am I in a religious Muslim space or a, or a <clears throat> uh, uh, Jewish space? It's always that similarity, that language, the good, bad, and ugly. You talk about gender issues in Judaism, and every Muslim says, yep, that's my uncle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you talk about LGBTQ issue, yep, that's my cousin. And like, you see themselves, that, that empathy, that similarity is incredibly profound. The biggest learning stretch for many Muslims, uh, I don't want to generalize, but it's very common, they have a much easier time understanding Judaism as a religion. Hmm. If Judaism is a religion like Islam, like Christianity, it's a text, law, God, scripture, synagogue, worship, no problem. And given the Jewish experience in the Muslim majority world, where they had a religious autonomy, where they were able to practice their religion much easily and much more <clears throat> harmoniously with the um, Muslim majority compared to Christian Europe. So there is not much intel challenge there. But to understand Jews and Judaism as people, with a, as a nation, as an ethnicity, as a tribe, with a, with a desire to self-determination, that sovereignty, it's a very difficult uh, thing to uh, understand how a religious identity can also be your ethnic identity. Like, I am a Turkish Muslim. My national and ethnic aspirations are Turkish, but my religion is Islam. This could become all one in the Jewish community is an incredible big challenge. Mm -hmm. And that's why I highly encourage my, our uh, co-conspirator, Yossi Klein Halevi, his latest book, uh, my letters to my Palestinian neighbor is an incredibly profound way of explaining uh, as a result of MLI, he understood this is a much difficult issue for many Muslims to understand. He wrote this incredible, beautiful book. In a way, you don't have to agree again any of the policies of the state, but here's an explanation how you can be both a religion and a people. How you can both be a faith community at the same time a nation that aspires to have a, a majority and sovereignty. Just to give one example of how um, this, this manifests, um, for, for Islam, which is a religion based on faith in God, the idea that you can be connected to a people without that faith in God, uh, as, as Yehuda quotes someone saying, um, the Jewish people believe in one or fewer gods. Um, and then one of the biggest <laughs> questions, one of the biggest questions that we get from secular Zionists uh, to secular Zionists is, wait, you're telling me that you have claims to this land based on a Bible that you don't believe God gave you? Like, how does that make any sense? Um, and that's, that's a manifestation of, uh, of this very struggle. Again, in the peer result, there are more Jews believe that this land is promised to the Jewish people than the number of Jews who believe in God. So there are more Jews who don't believe in God. And so go figure that secular Judaism is a very difficult thing to, secular Zionism, I, I apologize. Secular Zionism is a very difficult thing to grapple with. Yeah, thank you. So um, one of the things that MLI is about, it's learning about the values and visions and struggle of the Jewish community. Um, what are some of the deepest concerns for the Muslim community today? <clears throat> In North America. One of the most important concerns, which I alluded at the beginning of my talk, is Muslim continuity. Islam doesn't have the resilience and the survival gene that Judaism has. And Judaism developed the survival gene in the face of hostility. It is one thing to preserve your continuity, your tradition, once you are subject to ghetto ghettoization, living in the same zip code with your own people, you are not wanted and exacted. So Judaism is also experiencing what happens when there's no, not enough hate around you, when there's comfort, when there's acceptance. 
how Jewish continuity will go. Similar to American experience, there were close to a million Muslims came to this country between, uh, between 1870s to 1924, when we closed bo uh, the borders. Mexico, Canada, and the United States. Every study says maybe 10% remain Muslim. By the second and the third generation, that initial immigration wave, they just disappeared, they just assimilated. Mm. It's a difficult thing, language and tradition is not genetic. If you don't teach and if you don't pass on to one generation, and it deteriorates very quickly. It's like a language. It is not spoken, it is spoken less in the second generation. It is not spoken in the third generation. It just disappears. I think the biggest concern is we want whatever this melting pot of America promises us, the civil liberties, the economic prosperity, comfort, safety, security. But we want minimal cost to our tradition. Is there a way in which we can negotiate this melting pot in a way that my grandchildren will know who Muhammad is, that their kitchen will reflect my ethics and values, that they will have a love of Allah in their heart. This is a very real, genuine, genuine concern to many, many Muslims. The second concern is Islamophobia. In this country, after 9-11, um, if you look at the polls, early 2002, if you look at Gallup, Pew, PRI, and the other polling agencies, Four, five months after 9-11, when Americans were asked, basically, is Islam a kosher religion? Is Islam an acceptable religion? Is Islam an American religion? Are American Muslims equal American citizens? Number of people who said no to that question is about 20, was about 20%, early 2002. Now, the recent poll, 2019 or 2020 numbers say, 57% of Americans says no to that question. 57% of Americans, more than one in two Americans. And it is, it is geographically significant. In blue states, that goes down to 30%. In red states, it goes to 80, 90%. So um, large segments of Americans, majority of whom belong to a particular red states, particular faith communities, particular political party, moved from, I don't know, I'm frustrated, I have no idea who these people are, what Islam is, what American Muslims are, to something is wrong with these people. Our reputation, our image, more than, one in, more than half of American fellow Americans, they feel uncomfortable with the whole concept. And American Jews know all that well, how that large-scale dehumanization, hatred, what will that mean? How will it translate when something goes really wrong or out of control? The second question is incredibly uh, uh, the Islamophobia. The third question is related to the both. In this hostile environment, where even if there is no hostility, keeping the tradition is a, in itself a very difficult job. How are we going to keep what needs to be kept? And how are we going to change what needs to be changed in Islam? How are we going to engage with real American conversations? I'm a college chaplain for the last 20 years. The younger generations are asking, independently from any faith tradition, asking three or four questions, litmus test about their faith tradition. <clears throat> they are asking three, four central questions whether or not I am going to continue to believe in this tradition. One, what does this religion say about women? And how do they value the role of women in this tradition? Is there any way? And if you are going to keep those practices and the things that we have been saying about gender dynamics in our tradition, we are going to lose a very significant number of future generations. They are not going to sign up to this. Second, what does this religion say about the members of the other faith traditions? What, what are they saying about the members of people who are following other faith traditions? What is their role? Are they ethical, moral people? Will God's light will ever shine upon them? Again, if you don't have a new and more compelling and engaging answer to these questions, many of them will sign off. LGBTQ. Another very real American conversation that people are asking themselves. This has nothing to do with Islamophobia, etc. It has something to do. But is the young generation can, can relate and connect to Islam that is deeply rooted in Islamic tradition, but answering these modern questions, these compelling questions, in any meaningful and constructive and loving and caring way. Yeah. Um, this is the third category of things which we are struggling with. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I hear a lot of similarities. Um, you know, and you know, there, there's a few different themes that uh, that you've both touched on uh, that I want to bring out. And this is a little bit of a different question from that aha moment question, but um, it does have to do with what we can learn from each other. Uh, there was a, a pilgrimage of a group of rabbis um, to Dharamsala, um, India, um, in the 90s. It was captured, the story was captured in the book, The Jew and the Lotus. And they came to, to meet with the Dalai Lama, um, and the Dalai Lama had asked, because the Dalai Lama was interested in learning from Jews, you know, that we as the Tibetan people are exiled from our land, how do we keep our tradition going when there's and and they looked at you know at jews you've been you've been doing this for for years and years and years um interesting enough one of the main answers was summer camps and as a result um the um the dalai lama sent tibetan emissaries to jewish summer camps all over um, all over the country, and I was at one of them when when they came, and it, and and at the same time there was this as not only that learning, but um, but those rabbis who who also experienced um, were able to have reflected back to the Dalai Lama some of the incredible depths of their own tradition. That's on one hand. That's one hand of how uh, another people was learning from from Jews. On the other hand, I also, in my rabbinic thesis and interest, learned, have learned a lot about and explored how much Judaism, especially our mystical tradition, has been influenced by Sufi teachings, especially in the 9th, 10th, 11th century. Even the Rambam Maimonides and his, his son, Abraham Maimonides, even went ahead and said that the prophetic tradition in Judaism had been lost for many, many years. This is, this is uh, but, um, the, but the Sufis have kept it alive. And you were speaking about the beauty of prayer and prostration, and we know that we used to have that kind of prostration and that kind of style prayer, and for different reasons it went away. But he was basically saying, if we want to learn about our own prophetic tradition, we need to learn from from the Sufis, from, um, from those who are practicing Islam from this more mystical experience. And so for me, it's, I look and I see the way that, that Islam has played a, a huge effect on our own tradition and especially on those pieces. So my question um, for, for you, for both of you, is one for Abdullah, is what do you feel like is some of the most important things that Muslims can learn from the Jewish people? Um, and I and I'm thinking about that as you said. You know, how do we keep our our tradition alive in this country? And Maytal, what do you feel like are some of the most important things that Jews can learn from from Muslims? So. So I think uh, I'd go back to prayer, but uh, I'm not going to do uh, the prayer one again. Um, I think that there is a diversity among the Muslim community. I mean, there are many, many more Muslims, obviously, than Jews. Uh, but but in, <laughs> um, in, in North America, the communities from all over the world uh, who are Muslim are coming together, um, learning to live together. You have, and um, and with African American Muslims, uh, and and there is such rich culture and tradition, and uh, and an exchange of of that um, those ethnic backgrounds. And I think our community. Look, I think um, in in honest conversations, we all struggle with. Um, what it looks like to build more diverse communities and how we uh, and how we integrate, especially in an America, um, I won't speak to Canada, but especially in an America that um, we swim in waters of deep racism. Uh, but as we, um, as our community tries to figure that out, like what does it look like for our community to be more ethnically and racially diverse? Uh, I think we have partners, um, strong partners in that work, and there's a lot to learn from a community that is far more diverse um, than we are. Beautiful. Thank you. 
Your question is profound, and because of that question, I initially started MLI, it was a self-defense tactic. How can we defeat Islamophobia in the Jewish community? How can we undermine the Muslim-hating Jews and Jewish organizations? But why I am in it day and night working really hard is uh, that self-defense became a secondary motive for me now. The incredible amount of wisdom, accumulated wisdom, learned through successes and the failures of the Jewish community. How did Jews in America evolve from a hated, despised minority of 1920s into a beloved uh, community, minority of 2022. And what kind of successes and failures, what mistakes, what successes they have gone through. How can, there's so much untapped wisdom there that we can learn communally and socially. Therefore, um, one of the funniest and dirtiest and misleading, horrible word hyphenated word in our culture today is Judeo-Christian civilization. Mm -hmm. Like, it's funny. When I first heard, I thought it was somebody was mocking. What Judeo-Christian civilization? <laughs> mm -hmm. If you study Jewish-Christian relations for the last 2,000 years, you would be ashamed to call it Jewish. Uh, it, was a relationship, it wasn't a relationship. It was something uh, completely hostile where Jewish communities are saved in Europe because of a very particular theology otherwise. They were all seen as Christ killers and et cetera. So there was no joint civilization per se. But one can talk about Judeo-Islamic civilization, as you said. Not only Islam, Sufism influenced Judaism, but Judaism influenced Islam too. There was a joint civilization. If you look anywhere in Andalus, anywhere in North America, North Africa, anywhere look in the Middle East, much of the art, music, architectural genius, it was a joint Islamo-Christian Jewish civilization. Every, every mosque you go to in any city, I am assuring if you go through this, there is a Jewish wisdom, Jewish understanding, music. Like, um, I can give many different examples. There was a joint civilization. If you can resurrect that joint civilization that we have achieved, it wasn't rosy, it wasn't egalitarian, it wasn't equal to any first century uh, democratic progressive, but in its own time, it was a joint, commonly produced civilization that accumulated wisdom is there for us, for us to explore together as American Jews and American Muslims to see how that accumulated wisdom can inform our struggles of continuity in North America. There is so much to be learned. I can give many different examples, yeah. but it's endless. So why I am doing MLI? Because MLI became to me and many of the participants a Jew Muslim shopping cart in a Jewish supermarket. We are going through decades and decades of Jewish experience because uh, cross-faith and cross-cultural engagement is best when it becomes a mirror to you. You are trying to understand and make sense of people who are different than you, but that experience holds a mirror to you. At some point, you learn more about yourself in the experience than the community that you are trying to understand and make sense. When it's done, and MLI is, I think, uh, doing uh, really one of the most promising job in that sense, as self-serving as that statement sounds, but it is giving more insights to its participants about American Muslim identity, how we are going to survive, how we are going to carve out a respectful space in American society for ourselves, how are we going to build complex institutions, complex sets, etc. One thing I will say, and that will surprise you, that will surprise the Jews at least, if I want one thing, if I can pick one thing we can learn from the Jewish community, culture of disagreement. <laughs> I am just blown away. Like every time I see the Shalom Hartman is a pluralistic, incredibly inclusive organization. Under the same roof, you have far right, far left, anybody and everybody in between. Not too far right, right too early, but majority of the. Hartman goes and teaches to J Street. Hartman goes to AJ Street. There are Hartman faculty uh, who has no problem in calling occupation is a complete moral failure. There's a Hartman faculty. This, this is not an occupation. Uh, we have a right, biblical right to there. But they are under the same roof. The Muslim version of Shalom Hartman would look like under the same madrasa, Sunnis and Shias, Ahmadis and Qadianis and Ismailis, pork eating, shar uh, um, sharab drinking, uh, wine drinking Muslims and uh, Pakka Muslim, very pious Muslims are, it's, it's unthinkable. Like, it's really unthinkable that level of intellectual diversity. Disagreements are real. These people are 
not agreeing with each other at all. In so many ways, they find engaging with Islam, I, it was very clear. Most of the Jews, they find dialoguing with Muslims a lot easier than dialoguing with fellow Jews. They have more problem with their fellow Jewish community, but somehow they find a way to work together. That culture of disagreement, that ability to find overarching loyalties and connection and sense of uh, belonging and service to the community is a source of envy and admiration uh, and jealousy, quite honestly, for me. Beautiful. Well, thank you. So I have one, one more question, and then I want to open it up to, to everyone to be able to <clears throat> ask and share some more. You know, we haven't spoken so much about the nature of the tensions between the two communities. Um, and as we're, you know, being able to, you know, come together and have dialogue, the, the tensions and the pain that's around the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is very present. Uh, so you mentioned earlier, Abdullah, about building trust. That, that's really, it, it's really the key, like all, all the way through, to be able to, um, to talk about the things that are real. And I know that as I think about in our um, Orange County community here, we have a really wonderful relationship with the Orange County Islamic Foundation. We, um, every, with them and also the Shepherd of the Hills Church, every year we do, um, we put together Thanksgiving baskets of food for families in need in Orange County. And we really rejoice in coming together and in, in being together. And, and yet I feel like with, you're coming here, and, and a, a lot of us too, we're starting to be ready to say, some of us, is it's not enough. You know, we need to be able to bring our full selves to, this, to these relationships. We need to not pretend that there's these issues happening. And so the key, what I'm hearing you say, is the key is trust, is being able to build trust to have those conversations. Tell us more about how your experience about what's been successful in building trust. You know, what are the things that, um, that, that you would say to Jews about how they can help build tr more trust with Muslim community and to Muslims about building trust with the Jewish community? Uh, it's, it's very interesting um, to, I think, a key, I think a key component of the trust that we have found um, is critical. Uh, is is actually the honesty and vulnerability. So I think part of what where the mistrust comes in is when in the relationship everyone feels like they're tiptoeing around or they can only present a certain part of who they are. Uh, but all of us um, individually are really complex with multiple identities and our communities are any given synagogue, any given Hillel, any given mosque, is actually made up of individuals with really, really different perspectives. So um, I'll give you an example. We had um, a convening of uh, Muslim colleagues who were on campus and Jewish colleagues were on who were on campus, and we brought them together for a day to talk about what's unfolding between Muslim students and Jewish students on campus. Uh, and one of the Hill directors at one point in the conference said, you know what, at the end of the day, what you're gonna see is the statement that we put out. And so you're gonna think that everyone is behind this statement, but what you won't see is the way that writing that statement and putting that statement out actually tore our community apart and that there is incredibly diverse perspectives within our institution, even though we may have to publicly say something about what's unfolding. And I think that when we can peel that back and when we can create the trust um, built on a level of vulnerability to say, we don't actually all agree, um, and when we can put to down um, the talking points, the talking points that either we think and rarely do convince one another, uh, and um, or they're to like prove our loyalty, but when we can actually show that disagreement and actually show the ways in which um, we might not all have the same perspective, it opens up the space for, for someone else to say, yeah, you know what, in my community too, we don't all agree, and we actually have multiple perspectives. That's one piece. 
The second piece that I think is really important is something that um, Yossi Klein Halevi, uh, the, the colleague at the Hartman Institute that founded the Muslim Leadership Initiative um, and wrote the, with Imam Abdullah Antepli and wrote the book that Abdullah um, referred to, um, he says to our groups very often, you don't have to believe what I believe, but you have to believe that I believe it. And you have to believe in the sincerity of the other person and what they are telling you, that they actually do believe it, and that instead of asking them, what is your political position, asking them, why do you hold that political position? What are the values? The political position itself, I can think it's immoral. Um, I can find it problematic. But can I understand what is the driving force? Is it justice? Is it continuation? Is it compromise? Is it a love of your people? What is it that's driving that political position? And what, we of, what I often find in, <clears throat> in MLI and in other spaces where we're coming together across difference is that while our political positions might actually be quite different, and of course they're probably different on only one set of issues, we probably have a lot in common, but um, is that actually our values and our commitments, whether it's a loyalty to our people, um, whether it's around continuity, whether, whether it's around faith or justice or human rights, safety and security, that those are actually shared values that how they manifest in political positions might look very, very different. Um, and the third, the third piece that I'll say, and I think we've hinted at this, um, is around language, that there are trigger words that we actually don't understand the way that they land for our um, communities. I gave Zionism as an example before. I think Abdullah mentioned Sharia, uh, which is also another word that I think has lost its meaning, that we don't ask Muslim friends, what does Sharia mean to you? We make all sorts of assumptions about the kind of laws that maybe um, Muslims are trying to enact in this country. Um, and so when we start to break those down and actually ask, uh, what, what do you mean? when you say Zionism? What do you mean when you say Sharia? And I'll go even further. What do you mean when you say pro-Palestinian, right? When, so when, when sometimes when we hear pro-Palestinian, some Jews automatically think, oh, if you're pro-Palestinian, you must mean Jews have no right or ability to live in that land. But maybe, maybe actually what you mean is that Palestinians should have equal rights and an ability to vote for their own government. Maybe that's what you mean. And when we can step back and ask, what does pro-Israel mean? Does pro-Israel mean that there should be no Palestinians in the land? Um, or that we should continue an occupation indefinitely? For many people, that's not actually what pro-Palestinian means. But for, for some, that's what they, they think it means. So if we can peel back um, and try to understand what we're actually referring to and how each of us um, understands what the other is saying, it'll make a big difference. <laughs> Uh, profound. Um, you are absolutely right. Um, without attacking, tackling the trust deficit, uh, there is no point really. And why this there is trust deficit? Because of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict within Jewish and Muslim communities. So I hope I'm not disrespecting to any attempts or any initiatives that you have mentioned and others. You may not start with Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but any Jewish-Muslim dialogue or initiative from the very beginning, if they are not aiming intentionally and deliberately, hoping that their relationship will uh, get into a level of sophistication and strength where they will talk about the Israeli Palestinian conflict, I think at its best, it's a waste of time. At its best, it's a waste of time. At its worst, it further problem, I mean, deepens the problem in our communities. We have to be able to engage what is dividing us, what is polarizing us, what is giving rise to Muslim anti-Semitism, what is giving rise to Jewish Islamophobia. There is no point in keeping these elephants in the room and talking about hummus, chicken, kosher chicken, halal chicken, like really, uh, it's, it's insane. <clears throat> uh, Meital gave us a broad menu. Uh, I will just quickly summarize the two things. I think that the work of trust building is always internal. It has to start internal. If you want to build trust between Jews and Muslims, a lot of work is initially internal. I love that Yom Kippur practice. And uh, for those who are Muslim, if you haven't been to a Yom Kippur service, I really hope you will go. Like one of the climax of that service is everybody beats their chest. 
about their sins, about their own guna, about their own sayyah. Nobody goes and beats the chest of the, this is what you have done, this is what you have done, etc. So the initial work of trust building between Jews and Muslims have to be internal. We have to look into our own problem. And if I can summarize, uh, it requires a lot of unlearning of each other. We have to unlearn some of the things that we have learned about the other people. The th stories, the terminology, and the definitions of the words that we have internalized for a very long time. I will give two to me main important one. The biggest moral homework for my community, for Muslim community, admirably and proudly pro-Palestinian majority of them, their moral homework in trust building if they are really serious about improving Jewish-Muslim relations is, they have to unlearn much of what they have learned about Zionism and what they have learned about Israel. They have to really revisit this issue because the way we have experienced the creation of the state of Israel and the stories that we have told so far is so complicated, so toxic, so inaccurate. It's leading to Muslim anti-Semitism in many parts of the world. We really have to, uh, like, we are doing to these terms what Islamophobes are doing to Islam. We are turning the entire complex identities around Zionism and Israel into one monolithic evil reality. So my community has to unlearn and relearn in its own accuracy and complexity what Zionism is and isn't, what Israel is and isn't, and what that Israel and secular nation states connection to Jews all around the world, we have some learning to do. And I think my Jewish brothers and sisters' main uh, and most important and maybe most difficult moral homework is, I, as a Muslim, later on understood how this creation of the state of Israel meant. What did it mean? What is Jews going back to their ancestral homeland? And 2,000 years of religious fulfillment in so many ways, and safety and security of, of, of the... I, I sort of understood that story. But without losing any of your pride to your Zionism, your love and loyalty and support to Israel, can you also open a space in your heart and mind that this creation of the state, this homecoming story, has shattered the entire people, has shattered the Palestinian community. That Palestinian suffering is not a fiction, it's not a lie. It is so real in its all, and it's getting worse in many parts of the world. Again, most people think it's not possible. Like there is a way, there must be a way in which for ethical moral Jews to internalize Palestinian suffering in much more serious way and putting their money where their mouth is. Again, you don't have to compromise on anything. There is a way in which, and I know majority of the American Jews at least, they are two state people, they really understand this. But there is a way in which I see that moral muscles are not there in terms of really internalizing this real human suffering that's been going on for the last seven, eight decades. Beautiful. Thanks so much for listening to our broadcast today. Next week will be our last episode of season three. We're always telling you that there are so many people working on peace between Israelis and Palestinians, and we thought it would be fun to show you by doing a recap of some of them that we've had the honor of speaking with during season three. Peace Between Israelis and Palestinians is worked on from many different creative angles, including but not limited to conservation, environment, and sustainability, using sports, music, art, language, interfaith dialogue, and for all ages, adults or kids in schools with education and in summer camps, trying to reach everyone, including the younger generation, who are already tasked with trying to solve this mess. Since the beginning of Peace with Penny, we've been having a great time learning about so many peace organizations filled with Israelis and Palestinians and others who want peace within the region. Amen. What will we be doing during our hiatus? We're already busy preparing for season four, starting September 13th. During summer, we'll be rebroadcasting some of the episodes, continuing to showcase peacemakers who work using many different avenues to help create understanding and move toward peace. We'll also be asking for some feedback from you, trying to make the show even better. At Peace with Penny, we strive to educate, and that means ourselves too. We hope you haven't noticed too much, but 
we're learning too how to do a vodcast better and want to do the best job possible to provide hope for peace. The folks we interview deserve for people to know about them, and we're trying to learn how best to accomplish that. Any ideas or if you could, please share our episodes. Thanks. We hope to have you join us next week. And for now, as always, we pray that someday everyone will be able to live in peace, shalom, and salam. Thank you.